Welcome to Flora of Ancient Egypt. The climate and unique geography of the Nile Delta offered a wide variety of plant species. Many of these plants served as sustenance for ancient Egyptians and as crops for trade. The Nile's consistent seasons allowed Egypt to sustain itself for centuries. Possibly the most useful of the plants was the papyrus. This tall sedge plant grew in abundance along the water's edge of the Nile. Commonly known for its use as paper, the ancient Egyptians found many other functions for it, including rope, sandals, and mats. Papyriform boats made from the plant are seen in paintings and reliefs, and were used in ritualistic ceremonies. There were many types of trees along the River Nile, such as the date palm, carob, and tamarisk. The earliest fruit tree cultivated was the fig tree, followed by apple, pomegranate, and eventually olive trees during the era of the New Kingdom. Mango cultivation was the result of a late import from Asia during the Middle Ages. Some trees were associated with gods, such as the acacia with Horus. The divinities Thoth and Seshat were depicted inscribing the reign of the king into a Persia tree. The sycamore was connected with the goddess Iset, patron of the ritual of life. So many tours, so little time. Whoa. Welcome to Fauna of Ancient Egypt. Domesticated and wild animals were features in ancient Egyptian bas-reliefs as early as the first dynasty. While the variety of wildlife served as a reliable food source, it also influenced both culture and mythology.
Egypt's terrain allowed for a diverse range of animals, including panthers, rhinoceroses, elephants, and many variations of antelopes. The Nile was home to many species of fish, along with hippopotami and crocodiles. The wide variety of birds that populated the riverbanks, from raptors and waterfowl to songbirds, were all catalogued within Egyptian hieroglyphic signs. Encounters with reptiles and insects, such as cobras, scorpions, and scarabs, influenced hieroglyphs and art. While all animals had sacred meanings, lions in particular represented power and royalty to ancient Egyptians. They were so prized by pharaohs that they were hunted to extinction within Egypt. <laughs> Welcome to Bread and Beer.
While the Mesopotamians invented beer, including using a straw to avoid the sediments and herbs, ancient Egyptians perfected the brewing method. Egyptian beer's quality was determined by alcohol strength, color, and flavor. During the Pharaonic era, beer was the most commonly used and important alcoholic beverage. The state and temples used it, along with bread, as payment to workers, and it was included on the lists of food offerings to the gods and the deceased. Beer was the popular drink of ceremonies and festivals. The festival of drunkenness was even dedicated to it. Considered to be quite nutritional, beer was also significant in the day-to-day -day lives of ancient Egyptians. Egyptian adults and children consumed beer with all of their meals, and medical texts include hundreds of remedies that contain beer. It remained the most popular alcoholic beverage until the Roman era. Recipes for beer varied over time and depended on the quality of the materials. Bakers and brewers typically worked alongside one another at the same workshop or house. Many families often produced the quantity appropriate to their own consumption, with better quality beers produced for festivals and other special occasions. The most basic recipe used malted cereal as the main ingredient. Fruits such as dates were added along with honey and spices. Once baked, bread would be crumbled into the brew to start the fermentation process. Adding grain enzymes would break down the starches, turning them into sugar and creating a thick mash. Once ready, the bread and grain mixture was compressed and then strained through a sieve with water into the mix of malt beer. Once fermented, the beer mash was transferred to large containers and again compressed by foot or with pestles. Once smooth, the beer was stored in pottery jars and sealed with a clay stopper. It probably couldn't be kept for long and likely had a thick, pasty appearance and texture. Very little was wasted. Leftover grains were reused to make sourdough bread or combined with the next batch of beer. While there are many ancient accounts for making bread, most of the knowledge known about ancient Egyptian brewing comes from an account by the alchemist Zosimos over 300 years after Cleopatra's reign. More recently, Dr. Delwyn Samuel, an archaeobotanist, has proposed alternate antique techniques to brew beer. However, experts are unable to replicate an authentic beer since not all of the techniques and ingredients used by ancient Egyptians are known yet. Food was prepared on the floor until the Middle Kingdom when cooking benches were introduced. The introduction of durum wheat improved bread quality, meaning that the upper and middle classes ate better. The poor, however, still may do with a diet consisting of a gruel made of vegetables, softened bread, or barley. Dough was kneaded by hand or foot, and when sufficiently blended, additional items were added, such as fruits, nuts, honey, and spices. To leaven the bread, they added sourdough or leaven from beer brewing. Ovens were circular or beehive shaped and made with clay or brick. If there was no oven at all, a bread maker used the hot sand to bake flatbread, a technique still in use by some Berbers today. Ancient Egyptians always had to fight off the omnipresent sand particles that were blown towards them. Despite their best efforts, sand regularly made its way into their food. Additionally, particles from the grain grinding stone tools and ovens they used also contributed to attrition and prematurely worn teeth. The team tried to portray this through toothache animations and commoners sweeping sand off. 
Welcome to the Egyptian household. In pre-Greco-Roman culture, women were considered equal to men in many matters. They owned property, testified in court, could divorce and inherit. Until the Greeks and Romans restricted their rights, Egyptian women could take over their deceased husband's trade. Marriage contracts included mentions of allowances and items of value brought to the marriage by the woman, which would forever belong to her. Certain professions were open only to women, such as weaving or professional mourning while others were available to both genders, including working as servants for the rich households. Social status did have an impact, though. The higher in status, the easier it was to obtain education and access different professions. Homes were generally composed of three rooms. First, there was the entrance, furnished with a small bench of brick probably intended for a statue and protective divinity. Then there was the ceremonial room, meant to receive guests. The last room was either a bedroom or kitchen. Furniture consisted of basic chairs, chests, and storage. Tables were not used for family dinners. Instead, each individual had a small table of their own. Marriages were a social contract rather than a religious construct. Family was vitally important to ancient Egyptians, and children were considered a blessing from the gods. The father, mother, and their children were the nucleus of the family, and cohabitation sometimes extended to mothers-in-law, sisters, aunts, and sisters-in-law. Status and wealth played a large role in the style and size of ancient Egyptian homes. Commoners' houses were built with sun-baked mud bricks. Wealthier homes were often painted in white and decorated with various motifs. Town officials and the rich lived in mansions with numerous rooms that were luxuriously decorated. Only temples and tombs, meant to last for all eternity, were built with stone. Funeral stone inscriptions focused on the main member of a household. 
Encircling this person would then be a spouse, parents, and children, possibly even siblings. These stones were so structured because there were no surnames in ancient Egyptian culture. Parents and children were a sort of family tree, which allowed for the identification of the deceased.